<clears throat> yes, hello everybody, bonjour. Um, as uh, welcome to uh, what I believe will be our last POSMED this spring. We will start up again in, in September. Uh, we have the uh, pleasure today of having a triumvirate uh, mm -hmm. talk to us about <laughs> highlights of the trip that they made to France last year after a couple of delays due to the pandemic. Um, I will let them carry on. Let me just say that I have I have muted everybody. Uh, please leave it that way so that we don't get background noise coming through. Mm -hmm. um, if you have questions, uh, leave them in, in the uh, chat. But uh, at the end, I will we will read off the ones in the chat. We'll also we'll also probably start unmuting people. But please please stay muted uh, during the um, uh, during the talk. And I will now turn it over to Patsy, Bill, and Mel. So, guys, it's Everybody. yours. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I'm just going to open up with a few comments. We took a 16-day uh, trip to southern France from Bordeaux to Toulouse. Um, it was a great trip um, during October. Um, we stayed two days on our own in Bordeaux. And then on the third day, we joined Road Scholar for what was a uh, a two-week trip. Uh, it was a little interesting coming back because we came in and out of Bordeaux, but we wound up in Toulouse. And that day from Toulouse to get back to Bordeaux, to get back to the airport and get back home was all day. Uh, and when I, uh, it was just a long day that day, but it was a great trip. Do um, you want to say anything initially or? Well, yeah, it was a great <laughs> trip. And uh, for me in particular, it was great to visit a part of France that I really hadn't uh, had the chance to visit before. So that was that was extra special. Well, um, I just, <laughs> I second that. Um, but also I'll be talking more about food. And as most of you know, I am really interested in food, particularly French food. And the food of the Southwest is really special. And I hope you'll get a sense of that when I talk more about it and later in the presentation. Okay, and let's go into what yes. share slides. We're going to share screen. Here. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Then. And then here's our slideshow. Uh, here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yep. Let's go up here. Or oh no, the here. So technical difficulties. Yep. There we go. There we go. And I'm going to go to um, where's the share. slideshow? Yeah. Screen sharing. Slideshow. There and. Slide show from beginning. Okay, now we should be ready. Okay, can everybody see yes, that? Uh, yes, yes, it's coming through fine. Okay, great. So, enter okay, thank you. Um, I've never shared a screen before, so we think it's going well. <laughs> uh, so, there were five of us went. Uh, us five joined 14 others for a total of 19 people in Southern France. And uh, you can see the names of the people, Mel, Patsy, Bill, uh, Roberta, and Marjorie. Um, and we really look forward to the trip and had a great time. Uh, I'm going to talk about two cities that we visited, Sarla and Rock Commodore. And I'll start now with where is Sarla? Well, it's in southern France. Um, it's a great time to go there in October because the weather is warm and you, you just can have a light jacket. Uh, we did not, we had great weather when we were there, hardly any rain, and it wasn't 85 or 80 degrees. It was just very comfortable most days. Um, uh, now, how do I just get rid of, make this a little I think bigger? You can try and move it. Just okay. And uh, this is a very, <clears throat> a very pretty town, uh, restored, which we'll talk about a bit. But Sarla, the Canada, is commonly known as Sarla, a commune in the southwest of the French department of the Dordogne, uh, part of the Nouvelle Aquitian region. region. Uh, it is the one of the biggest or the largest of the thirteen regions of France. Um, it is a medieval town that was developed around a large uh, Benedictine abbey. Uh, this abbey uh, itself appears in records as early as 1081, so more than a thousand years ago. 
and was one of the few in the region not to have been directly attacked by the Vikings. Uh, later on, the, uh, the abbey deteriorated a bit and was rebuilt in the Renaissance, Renaissance style uh, over a 50 year period. Uh, Sarlat, uh, the capital of the Perigord Noir in 1962 had the chance to become the test town of a new law called the Mauro Law. This law really aimed to restore and rebuild cities and to kind of indirectly also make them more attractive to tourists. Uh, substantial funds were provided to restore multiple buildings in Sarla. And this little town has the highest density of monuments, uh, historical monuments and monuments class A of any town in France, uh, which is saying something. Uh, it's a very pretty town, again, just uh, built for tourists like me. I am a tourist. I love to go there. Uh, and this was uh, fantastic. Uh, it's very well preserved and is considered one of the most representative towns of life back then in the 14th century. Mm -hmm. uh, has 77 protected monuments. And you can see the color of the buildings, uh, which after cleaning just just look, look great. Uh, it's a very small town, 9,000 people live there and is a gastronomic center that one of our friends will soon talk about. Uh, the other town we visited was Brac Commodore, uh, also in the same region, south, Southern France. Uh, a, in the lot department of South Central France, um, named one of the favorite villages. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why. This town, instead of having 9,000 people who live there, like Sarlat, has only 600 people living there with over a million visitors. But that's quite the flow of people and why do so many people come there? Uh, it attracts visitors for its setting in a gorge above a tributary of the River Dordogne and for its historical monuments and also for a statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary. It's attracted uh, pilgrims for centuries uh, from many countries. Uh, and it uh, also has a cheese by this name, or a Commodore, that has been awarded AOC status. Uh, this is the view, my, one of my favorite views of our whole trip. Uh, we went there at night and uh, I still remember this. Uh, and sometimes when I'm stressed, I try to think about this view because we saw this at night. It was incredibly relaxing and still and quiet. And it shows the three levels of the town. The highest, of course, the, the knights and the, the rich uh, families live. Uh, the middle level, which is a, which is uh, you get there by going to a grand scare staircase. I'll show you in a few slides. And the middle level was in, inhabited by the religious people, the clergy and their staff. And the lowest level way down below was the lay workers. Uh, there are several uh, medieval chapel, chapels uh, carved into the hillside, the hillside of this cliff. And to get to the top, there are 216 steps that I personally did not take. <laughs> <laughs> Is there an elevator? Uh, no elevator. Uh, oh, a, a, a half one, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, but pilgrims in the past to show their um, uh, devotion uh, have climbed these steps many, many times over centuries. And some people to demonstrate their sacrifice and devotion climb the 216 steps on their knees. It's just a very hard thing to do. It's, it's a lot steeper than it looks. Uh, the town below the complex of buildings and churches uh, was for centuries dependent upon the tourist, the, the pilgrimage trade, but now it's moved to uh, having tourists come there. Uh, and it's just a pretty little town at the bottom, uh, but it serves the dual functions of being a pilgrimage and a place for tourists. And that was Sarlat and Rock Commodore 
And I'll now turn it over to, uh, we have, we're gonna switch places for a second. Okay. Uh, along, along our trip, one of the places that we were taken was to this Musée Jean Lursa. He, as you can see, uh, had a beautiful residence, which included two medieval towers. You can see one of them in this picture. Um, he himself bought, bought the uh, residence uh, because it was kind of falling apart. And he spent much of his lifetime restoring the two medieval towers as well as the residence itself. But uh, we were given a tour of this um, his his residence, which now is his museum. It's located in the commune of Saint Laurent les Tours, which is in the department of Lau in the Occitanie region. Um, and some of his most famous tapestry works are in this museum, as well as he decorated the walls. He had other objets d'art, pottery, and so forth, all crafted by him. And now, nowadays, um, the city, the commune of Saint Laurent les Tours, uh, takes care of this property because it was bequeathed to the city as it is intact by his widow, Simone Yursa, in the 1980s. Um, here are a few facts about Jean Lursa. This is a photo of him. He was born July 1st, 1892 in Bruyères, which is in the department of the Vosges. And he was educated in the nearby city of Epinal. From there, he initially studied medicine at the Faculté des Sciences in the city of Nancy. But uh, upon graduating from there, he traveled extensively throughout Europe and upon his return, he began his art studies in seriously at the well-known uh, Art Nouveau School, the École de Nancy. After that, he moved to Paris uh, in 1912 with his brother André. And André was a budding architect. Jean was a budding artist. They frequented the lively artist Montmartre workshops. Here's a photo of Montmartre. And they became acquainted with, with other painters, uh, specifically Matisse, Cézanne, and Renoir. He became friends with Rainer Maria Rilke, who's a noted Austrian uh, poet. Anyway, he was uh, well acquainted with some of the uh, very famous artists uh, that we know today. Uh, he's, he himself founded a, a journal of poetry, of art, and social movement. And when World War I was declared, uh, he joined the French infantry on the front and had to be evacuated in 1915 due to injury. During his convalescence, his art was exhibited in Zurich. And then it was in 1917 that he, he became involved in his lifelong work, which was to revive traditional tapestry techniques, uh, such as began in the uh, Middle Ages. And this is what he's most famous for today, although he has other works of art, but he's most famous for this revival of traditional tapestry. Uh, in the course of his lifetime, he traveled extensively worldwide. He also uh, 
exhibited here in the United States, specifically in New York. Uh, and he would exhibit along with some of the most famous artists of the day, Raoul Dufy, Matisse, Braque, and Picasso. So, um, you know, he, he traveled with some of the greats and exhibited alongside them. Uh, okay, here's an example. Sorry, just go back one oh, if you yeah, can. Yeah. Here's an example of his art. This is uh, very symbolic, actually. This one was taken uh, at the end of World War II, or it was woven at the end of World War II. It's to symbolize the sun rising again over Paris after the end of the Nazi occupation. This is a uh, very um, indicative of the type of tapestry weaving that he did. Okay, we can, so here's another one. Uh, during the time of the Nazi occupation in World War II, uh, some of his work was deemed rather dangerously patriotic. And you'll see why in um, some of the next um, slides in particular because he featured the Gallic rooster. Um, and you know, that's a strong symbol of France. And so he not only had the rooster, but he included the red, white, and blue. And so to the Nazis, this was sort of dangerous and they were out to kind of confiscate some of his works. Um, Sadly, his, uh, his own stepson was um, captured by the, um, by the uh, German army and died in a prisoner of war camp. And of course, Lursin was very close to this uh, stepson and he blamed the Nazi regime for it. And he never quite fully recovered from the sadness of the loss of this, not having his own children. This was his uh, wife's son and he, he was so devoted to him. So that was a big tragedy in his life. Um, yes, here are two more examples of slightly better views of the type of tapestry that he was known for, rather sort of post-impressionist, I call it. Um, and the interesting thing is that the technique he, he was using uh, harkened back to the Middle Ages. He was using the same kind of weaving techniques. And I'm not a weaver, so I can't tell you exactly what those techniques are. But I do know that during the Renaissance, they changed the technique of, of uh, tapestry making. And they started making tapestries that mimicked paintings. So Jean Lursa became uh, kind of obsessed with that whole idea and decided it was a, a desecration of the real um, art of tapestry. And so his uh, works that you see here go back to the medieval way of designing. Uh, here are more, this one in particular, L'Homme de Hiroshiba, was his depiction in tapestry again of, of Hiroshima. What else is there to say about the horror of that event? This was his depiction of it. Again, over here is another Gallic rooster uh, showing his pride of France. Go ahead. And, and this is a, a close-up of the uh, tapestry about Fran uh, Paris at the end of the war, uh, war, mm -hmm. Second World War. You can see it says, bonjour de bon coeur et de tout notre sang. Bonjour, bonjour. Le soleil va se lever sur Paris. The sun will rise on Paris.
même si les nuages le cachent, even if the clouds are hiding it, it will be there. Okay, so we're going to change places. <laughs> Merci. Close the curtain for a minute. Watch the cord. Yeah. Watch the cord. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Well, hi there. It is approaching lunchtime. <laughs> so I'm going to finish our presentation uh, by talking about the food of the region. And um, in this region, I'm, and I'm sure you're all aware that regional cooking is of utmost importance in the cuisine of France. And the Southwest has a reputation for being the region that values and maintains its culinary traditions the most strongly. So here on the left here, um, you see um, this book called The Food of France by Waverly Root. Um, it is a, an exploration of the regional um, cooking of France. It was first published in 1958, and it is a true classic. It's as relevant today as it was then. And to understand regional French cuisine, Root came up with this concept of organizing the regions by the primary fat used in cooking. So he says there is the domain of butter. So think about uh, Ile de France, Normandy, Brittany, um, Burgundy, uh, butter, they use butter. There's a lot of butter and cheese in those regions. The domain of oil and of course, um, olive oil, uh, Provence comes to mind and the domain of fat. And the fats would be primary pork, duck or goose fat. And the region we visited, uh, the Southwest, is the, re the, the domain of fat, which is <laughs> great to say, yes, where are you going? I'm going to the domain of fat. Um, so I'm here, and I wonder if um, any of you have seen the movie. Um, it's in French, it's called Les Saveurs du Palais. Um, it stars Catherine Frott, one of my favorite French actresses. And um, it, in English, it was translated, it's called Haute Cuisine. Um, if you haven't seen it, I recommend it highly. But it is the story of Danielle Mazé de Pluche. And she is a cook from the Perigord. And she became the private chef for President Mitterrand. And I'm mentioning this because I think this gives you an indication of how important the cuisine of the region is in the general French cooking in the, um, the values of the French and their cooking. But this region is just at the top of the culinary pyramid. And so some key ingredients of the Southwest. Now over here, um, I'm saying duck and geese. And I um, you chose this photo. Um, this is a cookbook I purchased while I was there. It was in English. There's a French version as well. It maybe have been written primarily for tourists. But I chose this photo because it is shows a duck confit and because they chose this as a cover photo of their book about the regional cooking of the region and used duck confit as an example of a really important dish of the region. And we certainly found that was true. And walnuts. <clears throat> this is simply a photo I took in the market of a walnut tart. But we did see a lot of walnut trees. It was, I think it was the harvest then. And we saw them being harvested then. And it is, again, a very important. They also make aperitif with their green walnuts and things like that. And here are truffles. Um, and um, these are not the chocolate kind. These are the fungus kind, um, which are highly prized. Um, and found in, I think, the Perigord and um, Quercy regions. So let's talk about duck a little bit. Um, so here um, is a typical bistro meal. Um, this was a restaurant we all enjoyed doing our extra days in um, Bordeaux, extra days in Bordeaux. The restaurant was called La Cheminée Royale. Um, I think Pam went there as well. <laughs> Um, but uh, you can see it is the duck confit and served with pommes frites, which is a 
you know, pretty typical for a bistro restaurant. Sometimes the potatoes would be sauteed in duck fat. Here they were probably just done in the deep fryer. But um, to make duck confit, um, it's basically a method of, was traditionally an age old method of preservation. And to make it, you first salt um, the duck and it would be the thighs, either duck or goose thighs. They would be salted typically salt and often some herbs, especially, especially thyme. And that would be salted at least overnight. Then the extra salt is rubbed off and it is submerged in duck fat and simmered, very, very gently simmered. It's not fried. It's simmered for a long time in its own fat um, and um, until it's really sort of falling off the bone tender. Mm -hmm. And then it can be stored, sealed in the duck fat in a cool place. Mm -hmm. And nowadays with modern refrigeration, I don't think it's as much a method of preservation as it is just something delicious to eat that's very practical. And if you're interested in trying it yourself, um, you can find a recipe on the Alliance Francaise of the Lake Champlain region website. I did it for the May newsletter where I adapted the recipe to my kitchen. I didn't do it traditionally, as you can read about in the story, but I thought it came out very, very well. And on the right, or is that the right on my screen? It's um, called a magre de canard, um, which is the duck breast. And of course, in the US or, you know, in North America, of course, we do whole ducks. Um, canard à l'orange is a popular dish, you know, the whole duck roasted. But in the Southwest, they use every little part of that duck. Um, you know, the thighs are cooked separately from the breast. They use the livers on top here um, is some foie gras very much from the region, made from the duck liver, of course. Mm -hmm. And this is a cherry sauce. Um, and But they use every part of that duck. I did work in a restaurant in Paris some years, many years ago. The restaurant was called OK d'Orsay. I was a two-star and a place where many politicians and movie stars would go to. And I remember I was just a lowly um, sort of stagiaire at the restaurant, but I remember spending some time in the prep kitchen in the basement when the, um, the fattened ducks had come in and they were lying there with their big bellies. But we also used, and I can't remember, one of the things, one of my little chores was they had the skin of the duck neck. And we stuffed that with like a force meat sort of st sausage stuffing and made it in so used the next duck neck skin as a sausage casing. But my point is that no part goes to waste. Another um, dish you find frequently is a salad of duck gigier, um, gizzards, and it's delicious. Um, so this was um, a lovely dish that was done as a demonstration by a chef um, at La Traille in Vitrac, just outside of Sarlat. And it was interesting, he put two, um, duck breasts together, tied them up and seared them and finished roasting them. And meanwhile, he made a delicious reduction sauce with duck stock and um, cherry liqueur. But as I'm on the subject of duck, I will mention that typically um, the ducks in that region are the moular breed. And they're also um, fattened. They, they use um, gavage, which is basically force feeding the ducks. Now, it is uh, controversial. I mean, um, the peat people, um, animal rights people don't like it. It's just, it is part of their tradition there. I'm not going to go into it, but their ducks are a little different there because they have been uh, fattened specifically and specifically to, um, to make these enlarged livers, which makes the delicious melt in your mouth foie gras. And foie gras, of course, means um, fatty liver. So that's duck, and it's worth traveling to the Southwest <laughs> to eat duck. I yes, would say, is. and I would say that duck confit is about as common on restaurant menus as hamburgers are here. Would you agree, Pam? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, Pam's muted, so I'll, yeah, no, I would that. agree. It was everywhere. <laughs> okay, and so moving on to um, truffles. So we visited a truffle farm. 
so here, so what is this adorable dog doing? Well, of course, he's using his highly sensitive nose to sniff out truffles. And I, this, um, the farmer told us that she had purchased this dog. It was a breed from Italy that she had purchased for several thousand dollars, but it was worth every penny. And he had been trained to um, sniff truffles. Um, in the past, pigs were used for truffle sniffing. And um, we were there in October, which is a little early for truffle season. Usually that's December into January for finding truffles. So basically what we saw was staged. It was kind of like an Easter egg hunt for yeah. the dog <laughs> where um, he had to sniff out the truffles that had been planted, but he did, um, um, did find some and uh, one of our um, travel mates is holding one there so you can see they're not pretty things <laughs> they look kind of like knobby if you came across it accidentally you might just discard it but they are highly prized um, around the world um, it's a luxury product and now truffles you know are a type of mushroom and they're black um, if you cut them open that I mean it looks like a hockey puck it doesn't look like much but they're more known for the flavor they impart to other dishes rather than the flavor themselves. So they're often used in sauces. And one of the classic dishes um, is with a truffle, a simple dish. It's an appetizer it's served in high-end restaurants. It's truffles with scrambled eggs. And at that restaurant I mentioned, OK D'Orsay, we did this dish during truffle season, only truffle season. And it's because eggs are porous. So we had a large glass jar and we filled it with fresh farm eggs and truffles, interspersed truffles amongst the eggs in the jar and let that sit out to infuse. And while it sat, the truffle aroma would infuse the eggs. So that the, the when you broke the eggs, they already had the wonderful aroma of truffles. Then we would chop up some fresh truffle and put it into the scrambled eggs, the very creamy scrambled eggs at the end. But that's what I'm saying is the truffles are valued more for their aroma than for their texture or their taste themselves. But it was just fascinating to see that in action. Unfortunately, I don't have a photo from that day because it was about 50 years ago when we experienced that. And here we have cassoulet um, from Carcassonne. Um, Carcassonne is a, um, Bill gave us an overview, um, a description of some of the other beautiful medieval towns we visited. Um, we didn't, um, but we also visited Carcassonne, which is a medieval fortress town. And uh, Carcassonne is known for cassoulet. And I would say that um, cassoulet is probably one of the important dishes of the region. And there are, according to La Russe Gastronomique, there are three versions of cassoulet. Um, there is the version from Carcassonne, the version from Toulouse, and the version from Casaladari. And of course, this is the version from Carcassonne. I was you know, thrilled to go to Carcassonne and say, hey, I can eat an authentic um, cassoulet. Um, Cassoulet is made, is a mixture of, it's a complex dish, very, very long cooking dish. It's made from beans, white beans. Um, there will be uh, duck or goose confit. Also um, some sausage, also some cured pork, and usually also um, some fresh lamb, like a lamb stew or mutton stew, and may, or maybe a pork stew, depending on the the version. It's cooked with the regular aromats like onion, um, garlic, you know, bay leaf, a little bit of tomato, not a lot. But the distinguishing feature of cassoulet is its beautiful crust. Usually, it's topped with some breadcrumbs, and some of the recipes instruct people to kind of. Um, stir that in once it forms so it's just, you have this complex layering of crusts so I can tell you that um, we did I was thrilled that we 
We're in Carcassonne and went to a restaurant and were served cassoulet for lunch. <laughs> However, I think the restaurant was a um, tourist trap restaurant. And I, I don't really think this was the best um, cassoulet of my life. So I need to return and really do some more research to find a good restaurant <laughs> for experiencing really an authentic cassoulet. But anyway, that's basically the idea of cassoulet. And oh, I cannot um, talk about the food of the Southwest without talking about Canelé de Bordeaux. Uh, we were lucky because we stayed at an inexpensive hotel before we started our tour, mm -hmm. but the location was perfect because it was right beside this bakery called Bayardona, which is the premium bakery uh, for Canelés. They specialize in Canelés. And um, you can see on the left is a photo I took of, um, of the Canelé um, that I enjoyed on the terrace there with a cup of tea. And on the right is a photo of Canelés I made. And again, um, I did contribute this recipe. I, when I came home, I um, developed the recipe in my own kitchen. And that recipe is the recipe for June. Um, May, excuse me, we're in May, right? Um, in the Alliance Francaise um, uh, newsletter. And so it is on the website. If you search uh, culture and then cuisine, you'll find this recipe. Um, basically, it is, um, I have much more of the story of Canelais in the website, um, in my website article. But basically, it's an interesting pastry that you just don't find anywhere else. Of course, now it's the recipes proliferated. You know, you can get them here at City Market, <laughs> for goodness sake. But um, they really are from Bordeaux. Interesting stories about the origin. Um, an interesting one is that um, there used to be egg whites left over. Bordeaux, of course, from wine. Um, wine filtering or wine purification. They use the egg whites in wine production and there'd be leftover yolks. And so someone, possibly a nun or a monk, um, came up with this recipe using the leftover egg yolks, um, adding just flour and sugar and milk to make this delicious pastry. The name cannelé refers to the French word cannelé, which means ridged. So you can see the mold. Um, give you this beautiful ridge shape. So the pastry, if you haven't had it, um, it has kind of a crispy caramelized exterior, very crisp. And the ridge shape is perfect because it maximizes the surface for that crispness. The interior is this delicious custard. And the custard is just flavored with vanilla and rum. It's just totally simple um, and very special. Um, I can show you, I think I have here, oops, where did they go? Um, did you see those little cannelly moths I had? They were on the table. Um, they, no, they weren't. Hope, I hope, oh, here they are. Here they are, yeah. Um, I have a photo in, in, the, um, in the website article. I bought these cannelly molds at Bayardaran. I had another, I have had previous molds. Um, that I purchased, you know, through Amazon and, and at cookware stores, but they weren't the authentic um, copper tin lined molds. And these molds are typically very expensive. If you um, look on Amazon, you might find them for about $10 each. So if you want to make a dozen cannelés, it'll cost you about $120. Um, but I did find a much less expensive version, some carbon steel molds on Amazon that are more like $20, $24 for 12 molds. And I have all the links to that in the website article. But the batter is simply, you know, the eggs, flour, sugar, milk, butter, a little bit of butter, not a ton, and rum. Um, sometimes the molds are lined with beeswax and oil. Um, which is interesting, but I also found that softened butter works well. So um, I hope you might be interested in trying them because they are very, very specific to the city of Bordeaux. Now, these are just some other uh, photos of pastries um, that I took, you know, from pastry shops and meals. Um, here is something called a crustade de pomme. 
And actually years ago, I made something like this. Um, uh, there was a recipe uh, in uh, Paula Wilfert's Cuisine of Southwest West France. And it's like a phyllo dough. Um, when I did it, I used phyllo dough, but um, a real um, Southwest France cook would probably make her own dough, just rolling out very, very thin layers of simple pastry and buttering it and then and building up these layers. And the interior is filled with um, just like a compote of apples. And sometimes prunes are mixed in. Prunes are another very, very popular ingredient in the Southwest France, but these are really delectable pastries. Um, I had made it years ago and I was just excited when I saw all these um, custades sitting in a pastry window. And this is a, um, a tarte au noir. Um, we had this in Sarla. And it was at a, a simple restaurant, a pretty simple restaurant. As I recall, our main, my main course was just like a, a mushroom omelet with um, duck uh, potatoes cooked in duck fat as an accompaniment. And this was the dessert. It was the tarte au noir with like the region's fresh walnuts. And I thought it was so delicious. Mm. The walnuts were so sweet. Um, I did not detect any of those little bitter notes that you sometimes get with walnuts. Um, and I think because the walnuts were just so fresh um, when they made that tart. And of course, I actually bought a, a, a walnut book while I was there because I hope to be able to reproduce this tart au noir recipe. Haven't done it yet, but that's coming up. <laughs> and this, I'm sorry, these aren't great photos, but this um, recipe, Gâteau à la Brache, is fascinating. Um, here is one that I bought at the market in Albi. Um, Albi is another um, very historic, important town we visited. And we had time to go through the market. And I was really excited to find this Gâteau à la Broche. Um, and I managed to get it home. I think Mel was saying, how were you going to get that cake home? But it actually, it's very sturdy on the outside. And it fit into my suitcase nicely. And this is a photo of it just being served because you sliced the cake and I just served it with fruit. And it's, again, it was just a sort of like capture the moment photo. But I'll explain a little bit what gâteau à la broche is. I like to translate it as spit cake, which doesn't sound very appetizing. But basically, it's a cake cooked on a spit. Um, I haven't seen it in person. I've just read about it. Basically, if you think of rotisserie chicken and like you build a fire, you set up a spit or someone turns and the other person takes this batter. It's a very simple batter. It's just egg, sugar, milk, butter, a little rum and vanilla. And someone gradually pours the batter over the spit and it builds up and forms layers as the person turns. So it's an event. I believe it takes hours. Um, and you kind of do it when the weather is pretty good and you can be outside for hours drinking a cognac or something while you um, turn and pour batter on the cake. Um, and it forms this delicious crust on the outside. Um, and I, this one is actually one I bought in Quebec. This was prior to the pandemic. It must have been the year before the pandemic. I went to the Marche de Noël in Sutton and there was a vendor there selling gâteau à la broche. And I remember they were magnificent. They had all kinds of spikes and they kind of looked extraterrestrial or like some <laughs> kind of um, 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 cave or something. Um, and they were spectacular and it was really delicious. Um, unfortunately, when I went to the Marche de Noël last December, um, um, that vendor wasn't there anymore. And I've tried to find him, but I haven't had any luck. I think he may have gone back to France. But it is a fascinating dish. And typical of the region. Yeah, right? and very special. You don't find it anywhere else. Mm. And then these are just a few market shots. Um, most of these, um, I was just impressed because going through the markets was just a feast for the eyes. Um, but when have you seen the fish displayed so beautifully and artfully? I mean, it was just, and here, um, that was, um, I'm not sure which fish it is. Um, this is um, um, Coquille Saint-Jacques, you know, the scallops. And of course, here, we buy them in a supermarket or even a fish store, but they're already shut. 
There they sell them in the shelves. And of course you can use the shelves, clean the shelves and use them as a serving dish. Um, again, when I worked at that restaurant in Paris, I remember spending an entire day shucking a coquille Saint-Jacques in the basement. And I could tell you when I went home that night, I did not smell pretty. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, here, I think this was the uh, market in Sarla. And you can see there's a store um, just specializing in foie gras. It's a foie gras, all various foie gras products, different pâtés, um, pâtés and different type. I think it's mainly bottled and preserved and maybe sometimes he also sells truffle, truffles and um, seps. But really this is just totally products of the region and a lot of foie gras, which was exciting to see. And here, of course, we know when you go to France, um, you are treated to the most incredible um, array of different cheeses, um, all artisanal cheeses. And it was fun to see the selection of cheeses in the markets. And here, um, I just put this together, a little a compiled a bibliography for you. Um, in case you're interested in reading more about the um, cooking of Southwest France, um, the one at the top, The Cookery of Southwest France, is the book I purchased uh, with the duck confit there. I'm not sure how available it is here. I just read this book, A Journey in Gascony by Kate Hill, um, which was quite nice. She was a barge owner who cooked on her barge and had guests and wrote a lot of lovely mem food memoir about the food. Um, Danielle uh, Mazette Dupletch is the woman from Haute Cuisine. Um, and I purchased her book and I showed you the cover of the book in that first slide. And so that's a great book, for, um, really genuine, authentic um, recipes from the Paragor region and the, her, her fascinating story. Another book I recommend is called Duck Season by David McGinnich. It's a food memoir. He spent a year living in the region um, and it was in his book. He has a chapter on um, Gateau à la Broche and that's when I really learned about it and uh, um, had made a very great vivid description of how to make it. And of course, Waverly Roots, the food of France and my Bible, um, the um, the Cooking of Southwest France by Paula Wilfert. So I think we can stop the screen share and open it up to any questions. I think we're actually in good time. We have about 10 minutes left for questions. Okay. You wanna cut? <clears throat> okay, lovely. Why don't we um why don't we first go to the chat and um uh, I will kind of go, you know, you can probably see them as well. Um, uh, I had a question for, for Bill. What, if, if Rocamadour has millions of visitors every year, or a million, or however many zillions of tourists, how did you manage to get all those photos with nobody in them? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. When we took that photo of uh, Rakamador at night, uh, it was probably two or 3,000 feet away. It's much bigger. Um, maybe some people were hidden in the photo you just don't see, or maybe everybody went to bed at night. I don't know. Yeah, but um, you know, the staircase, the staircase was empty. Yeah, yeah. No pilgrims. Uh, I know. Yeah. That's a good question. I don't know the answer. Yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah. There's, a, there's another one for you um, from Mark. Um, he said, why the brass geese sculpture in one of the Sarla slides? Yeah, I think we understand why I was asking it just because now that we've seen about all the food, uh, but it's in one of those pictures and it's a wonderful sculpture, Stan's actual animal height and it's uh, uh, three or four geese uh, walking in the streets of Sarla, a uh, big brass mm. sculpture, it's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. And very yeah. typical to see the geese. Yeah. Yes. I was really hoping to be able to get a photo of the typical farm with the geese walking in a little parade, but I saw it once when we were on the bus moving, but I wasn't able to get the photo. Ooh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I see that um, Eric asked, um, I guess, for Mel, there's yeah, yeah, some yeah, relationship yeah. to the Gobla. Yeah, the, the um, you know, when I think of when I think of tapestries in recent history in France, 
I think of the um, the tapestry works in Paris of uh, Les Gobelins. Um, yes. And and I was wondering, I was wondering if Lersat had had any relationship to um, to the Gobelin uh, tapestry place. Yes, he uh, did. Which is which, which is which uh, we've never done it, although we've stayed in hotels around the corner from it. We but you can visit it um, at times. But anyway, was there any connection there? Yes, there was. They did. They did. Uh, he did connect with not only Gobelin, but also Aubusson, okay. the other very famous tapestry weave weavers or company. And he he worked with both of them actually. Um, so you know that's that's the quality of his tapestry work that the great companies, uh, you know, kind of wanted wanted to weave for him. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, actually, the you know we think of you know onto your ducks. And Kim has a question, but I'll, I'll, I'll interject a brief story. And that is a number of years ago, Kim and I spent a vacation um, on, a, on a duck and goose farm in the Quercy. And they had these great big, magnificent duck and geese that were just kind of wandering around. And one time we passed the, the woman of the couple who ran the, ran the farm and told her what Dr. Yusuf was mainly Kim told her what beautiful ducks and geese she had. And she gave us this look like, haven't you ever seen a duck before? <laughs> <laughs> but they truly are, they make they make the kind of ducks that you see around here, and especially these scrawny things you find frozen in the supermarkets, right. look truly pathetic. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's a combination of the breed and the feeding methods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd like to I'd like to give a shout out to Road Scholar. This trip was so well um, mm -hmm. coordinated, and we we haven't even talked about the amazing prehistoric cave art. <laughs> yeah. which, we leave that to Eric, <laughs> which we also um, witnessed and went to, and saw actual um, cave art, not all, not just the reproductions, but the real things. Uh, but Road Scholar, really, that trip from Bordeaux to Toulouse is is really quite remarkable. And I just wanted to say that if you get a chance and and would like to take a trip with them, I highly recommend their trips. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Or you can get recommendations from people who took the trip. Like thank yes. you. For that. Yeah. Because uh, I, I went to Peshmero because Patsy recommended it, and it really was awesome. Mm. And the restaurant in Bordeaux was very good, too. Yes. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I, at I, times we were actually too busy on the trip. I, <clears throat> I wanted to stay in the hotel and not go out to an afternoon event. But then I, I, I was afraid I'd miss something. So we did go. But they really kept you busy. It was mm -hmm. a great value for two weeks with the hotels and... I don't have the uh, level of food expertise that Patsy does, but I would say the food was very good. Mm. Uh, a lot of it, very good. And it kept you uh, very well, uh, very busy on the trip, which for me was good. Yeah. And I'm going to add something too in that at Roca Madur, you know, um, Bill mentioned that it was a pilgrimage site. And one of the reasons is that Virgin Mary that he spoke about, that's uh, one of the few black Madonnas. Yeah. And yeah. that's kind of a cult thing, or at least it was back in those pilgrimage days. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, um, one of the reasons that it's so famous there at Roca Madura. Mm -hmm. And the other one is that the Carcassonne, which is that incredible fortress uh, city, um, there's a saying in French, and I don't know the saying, but the gist of it is that before anyone dies, they need to have seen Carcassonne. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'd say that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I see Kim has a question. Yes, on, where do you um, buy duck in Vermont? Okay, well, you know, I am, um, because I live close to City Market, um, yeah, I buy, I've been buying my duck legs 
and you can buy duck breast as well. I tend to buy it at City Market and they have it, you can buy it a cryovac, so it keeps pretty well. And that's the duck I used when I was testing the confit for the confit recipe in the, um, in the newsletter and website. But again, I also mentioned that if you do go to Quebec, um, if you go to the Eastern Townships up by um, Lac Brome, there is the Lac Brome duck farm there, and you can buy all manner of duck there. And there's a lot of duck in that area of the Eastern Townships, and it is okay to bring back, especially because it's usually packaged. But one thing that was very sad I learned recently is that the farm suffered an epidemic of bird flu, and I'm not mm -hmm. sure they have any um, duck available now, mm -hmm. but that is another option. But at City Market, for sure, if it's not on the, um, the shelf, when you go, you can also have it ordered. But I, they all, I've seen it as well at Shaw's and Price Chopper and various markets, but it hasn't been too far. Of course, our du the duck we buy here is not the same. It's a different breed. And of course, it is much leaner, as you mentioned. Yeah. 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 Mm. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, 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 you know, you know Beth, Beth said uh, what I think all of us uh, feel watching your, watching your presentation, because you found it now. Um, yeah, that's especially at lunchtime as we said and eat our peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. <laughs> it's it's a little bit of a contrast. Okay. I, I don't know if I should tell you, but um, I still have a few cannolis left in my freezer. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized that we're going to have them right now. <laughs> in about five minutes, we're going to test them again. Yeah, yeah. 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 Kim, by the way, they do freeze very well. Yeah. Kim, do you want to answer your other question or ask your other question? Yes, I uh, I was wondering what your your opinion is of foie maigre as opposed to foie gras. Yeah. If people have ethical objections to foie gras, is foie maigre a, a reasonable alternative? Yeah. You know, I would say it's quite different. I mean, I think there's the ethics question. Have you had uh, foie gras, Kim? You, I'm sure yes. you've had it. Yeah. I mean, to me, it is very special and different. It's just something different. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the di a regular duck liver is fine. It's delicious, but it is a different thing. Okay, that's fair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody? Anybody else have any any questions? Yes, Barb. Oh, come on. I, I just want to say I saw that movie too, The Hope Cuisine, and it's one of my favorite movies of all time. Oh, yeah, I agree. Oh. I could watch it. Also, I think Catherine Front's um, enunciation is so beautiful. It's so nice for us because you can understand mm -hmm. her, her French. It's just so lovely to hear her speak. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. No, I love that movie too. And uh, it was, it just kind of recently, it all came together like, oh, yes, the Paragore. And Mitterrand was really, really. Um, um, moved by, I don't think he was from the Paragore region. Does anyone know? I don't think it was actually his origins, but his region, but he really valued the cuisine so much that he um, chose her. Okay, so Mark, do you know where that is? Yeah, from Angoulême. Yeah, do you know exactly where in France? Angoulême? Real yeah. close, just north of the just north of the Dordogne yeah. region. So, so that's yeah. why you know he yeah. was from very close mm -hmm. by. But it really it yeah. just struck home on how important it is that it was featured in the movie. So I think you can for a long time the movie was available on Amazon. I think so. Yeah. It I still is. It yeah. still is. I just saw it there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? Check if anybody's okay. Okay, well, well, thank, thanks to all three of you, and grand merci. And um, you know, should we all have trips that are so wonderful? <laughs> okay. Well, bonne journée. Bonne journée, tout le monde. Bon appétit. Au revoir. Au revoir.